Thanks for tuning in to Tax Strategy Digest, where we explore the fascinating world of finance. Join us as we dive into the stories, insights, and experiences of experts, thought leaders, and everyday people who are making a difference in this field. Through engaging conversations and thought-provoking discussions, we'll take a deep dive into the latest research, trends, and innovations shaping finance. So sit back, relax, and get ready to learn something new on this journey here with us. Welcome to this episode of Tax Strategy Digest. Today, our guest is Dan Lukowitz. Dan is a senior director at Encore Real Estate Investment Services and specializes in shopping centers, medical office buildings, industrial fulfillment centers, quick service restaurants, and automotive repair and parts stores, as well as other net leased assets. Dan, thanks so much for joining me on this episode today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Awesome. And and Dan, why don't we get started? Tell us about your story. Tell us how you got into real estate. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. So uh, my name is Dan Lukowitz. Uh, like you mentioned, I'm senior director at Encore. Uh, we're a boutique net lease investment sales firm. I specialize uh, in, the, in assisting investors in the purchase and sale of net lease properties and shopping centers. Um, if you ask me how I got into uh, real estate, I would tell you that uh, back in 2005, uh, I helped to start a company called Disability Made Easy, which was a barrier-free home modification company. Um, impetus for the company was my best friend's father uh, was diagnosed with ALS, and we watched him go through all the you know the headaches of having to have one contractor for a grab bars, one contractor for the ramp, one contractor to do the bathroom, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So we started this company. I was in charge of the sales and marketing because that's kind of like what I love to do. And I remember one time I was driving with the project manager that we had, and we went to a specific site. An individual uh, had a, disab- a disability, you know, from a, a car accident. And I remember pulling up to this property and been going in and saying, how in the world could this property be suited for this individual? Like, it's not handicap accessible at all. It's not barrier free. Like, let's just get a, you know, a wrecking ball and, you know, take this property and put it down to the ground. And I remember in about 45 seconds, the project manager took out a piece of graph paper and sketched a new front elevation and layout to this property. And it blew me away to see that something could be, you know, taken from uh, its, its current state and altered to make it more, you know, functionally, um, you know, beneficial to its to its occupant. And that was something that like stuck with me. When it came time for, for uh, you know, me to buy my first home with my family, um, I was looking at properties that were 100% move-in ready. I was ready to buy one. And then I got wind that there were a few properties that were bank owned. This was back during the foreclosure crisis that were bank owned only a, you know one street away. So I approached the, the, the lender, uh, made a deal, bought the property, and then uh, proceeded to hire out each individual trade and kind of you know, play general contractor. Um, so I, I really got a taste for this this uh, idea again of taking something that was functionally obsolete or dated, and then adding some value to it, and then the sum being greater than the part. So the, I went on at that point, you know, Paul, over the years to to, to flip probably seventy five or eighty houses. Uh, that's really how I got into commercial into a uh, real estate, and that was how I got into real estate investment. All the while, you know, I was working at companies like Amazon as a business development executive or at a title company as the, you know, sale, directing a sales team. Um, and eventually I went full time into house flipping uh, and then I transitioned into commercial real estate brokerage, which is really where I stayed. I mean, I'll continue to flip houses here and there, but really my passion, my bread and butter, what I devote, you know, all of my attention to is being a net lease investment sales broker. Awesome. And uh, you're in Detroit now, is that correct? That's right. Okay, awesome. And and how has the market been out there compared to maybe the rest of the country? Yeah, I mean, so like from a residential perspective, I think it's been pretty stable. I mean, I have done a lot of house flipping in the city of Detroit, which had tremendous value, tremendous opportunity because the prices were so you know depressed for such a long time. But you know, as an investment sales brokerage, we have a, a broker, we have a national platform. So I actually sell property in all 50 states. Uh, in fact, right now I've got property listed in, you know, close to a dozen different states. So, um, you know, we're not really bound geographically to any specific markets, which which I think is great. So how do you get in touch with people from around the country? I mean, are they reaching out to you directly or are you finding them, uh, calling them? Are you networking through social media platforms such as LinkedIn? What does the outreach look like? So really the answer is all of the above. Yes, people are reaching out. People, you know, 
uh, gotten wind of what I'm doing and, you know, want to be involved. They want to sell their property. The majority of the relationships that I have start from, you know, me reaching out to them. Um, and, and it can be done a variety of ways, you know, so I send out postcards, uh, I send cold emails, I make cold calls. Um, that's more of like a one-to-one -one interaction, right? Like I pick up the phone, call one person, have one conversation. I've been very heavy throughout my entire career on social media because I believe that that's a one-to-many approach, right? So I can make a video, an educational video about the state of the market, or I can make a post describing the different types of leases. And that can be seen by 50 or 100,000 people. And then those people can reach out. So for me, you know, I like to... Uh, have a good mix of those one-to-one -one interactions as well as the social media perspective and just kind of keep it balanced. Um, ideally, the goal uh, is, you know, long-term relationships. And, you know, many of my clients are repeat clients and, uh, you know, I value those relationships dearly, um, you know, regardless of the way that they started. Now, you know, they're they're to the point where if they need something, they pick up the phone and call me. If I haven't heard from them, I pick up the phone and call them. And, you know, it's just becomes a, a great relationship. So a lot on your LinkedIn, you talk about net leased assets, and I know that's kind of what you focus on. Could you tell some of the listeners who might not be familiar with what that is, just kind of a basic overview of what a net leased asset is? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I like to explain what net lease is by first explaining what it isn't, right? So I like to compare it to multifamily, right? To a multifamily apartment complex. So I, what I want to do right now for our purposes, I'm going to compare a 10 unit multifamily like hypothetical multifamily complex with a Wendy's property, okay? So both properties are gonna bring in, in our example, $125,000 of annual income, right? That's the gross income. So Wendy's, they pay a check every month, it adds up to $125,000 a year, okay? The apartment complex, all of your tenants, let's just say they're 10 tenants, right? They're paying you a total of uh, you know, $125,000 a year. Now with the multifamily, with the apartment complex, your gross income is 125,000. However, you're going to have expenses, right? You're going to have an expense like property management. You're going to have an expense like taxes, insurance. You're going to have capital expenditures. You're going to have to do things like, you know, maybe fix the roof or repair the foundation or paint the building. You have to sweep the parking lot. You have to plow the snow. You have to cut the grass. You might have a vacancy factor, right? People are, you know, you might have eviction expenses. You might have, you know, someone who's doing your book. So at the end of the day, on a multifamily property, if you're bringing in $125,000 gross, your net operating income on that property might be half that. You might be bringing in 60, 65,000. Let's flip over to the Wendy's, right? So Wendy's is paying you $125,000. They're on what's called an absolute triple net lease. The reason that it's called that is because Wendy's actually pays for your taxes. Wendy's pays for your insurance. Wendy's pays to repair your building. And, and, and Wendy's has their own management. They take care of everything. They cut the grass. They plow the snow. They do everything. So at the end of the day, your $125,000 of gross rental income in the Wendy's is actually your bottom line. It's your net operating income because that $125,000 is net to you. Now, that's your standard you know, uh, vanilla, absolute triple net lease. There are other types of net leases like a double net lease, which is exactly what I described, right? The tenant pays for the taxes, the insurance, they pay for common area maintenance, but they don't pay for things like the roof and structure repairs, or in some cases, the parking lot repairs. So that's a double net lease. Now there are, are other types of leases as well, like a gross modified lease that is more common in something like a shopping center, in which case the tenant pays a base rent and the landlord may pay for all expenses or most of the expenses. So there are a lot of different variations, um, but at the end of the day, I, I, the, the triple net lease that I described uh, involves you know, something that is uh, zero landlord expenses. Got it. Okay. And so how does that differ from just like the, the regular, you know, leases that people talk about every day that they're getting, maybe it's like a medical office, right? So your question is how does an absolute triple net lease differ from like a medical office lease? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I do sell a lot of medical office buildings and in many cases, those are also structured as absolute triple net leases. Okay. So the exact same as that Wendy's lease, what I would say maybe is one of the only differences or one of the variables that someone should consider is that many times in a medical office building, the tenant has an incredible outlay of expenses and investment into their facility. Like for example, there's deals I've sold where 
the developer uh, de delivered what we call a white box to the tenant, right, to the medical tenant. So the developer delivered essentially a building that had drywall and electrical and plumbing and heating and all that. But the tenant wow. was responsible for all of the, the fixtures and furnishings. And in addition, they were putting in MRIs and imaging centers and, you know, all different types of equipment that's affixed to the property. The chances of them leaving at the end of their lease or at any point is much lower than in a situation where the tenant doesn't have that kind of capital uh, invested into the property. And so why are people reaching out to you all the way? And, you know, you're in Michigan, right? You're, you know, you're far yeah. away. Why are they reaching out to you versus someone who's local to them, who they can go, you know, shake hands with face to face, not to say that you wouldn't fly out wherever they are and meet them and, yeah. uh, you know, walk through the property, but it, it seems like it might be harder. What are some of the things that you bring to the table that maybe others aren't? Great question. So yeah, I will definitely fly out and meet them. That's for sure. Um, in response to your question, you know, commercial real estate, especially net lease real estate, the majority of what we sell is essentially a bond that's wrapped up in sticks and bricks, right? It's essentially a coupon clipper. In fact, many of these investors rarely, if ever, visit the properties. So, you know, my buyer for that medical office building in Des Moines, Iowa might not be in Des Moines, Iowa. They might be in Seattle, Washington. They might be, you know, in Silver Springs, Maryland. They might be in Detroit, Michigan. They might be in Miami, Florida. So, you know, you want a brokerage that has a national exposure because you want, as a seller, the you, you want your property to have as much exposure as possible, right? You want open market exposure so you get the best offers at the best prices with the best terms. So the reason they hire me is because, number one, I'm going to hustle hard. And number two, I have those connections. I have those databases. I have those relationships. I know who to call about that medical office building in Des Moines, Iowa. And they might be in California, right? They might not be in Des Moines. So it, it's really just about who is going to, number one, give your property the most exposure possible. Number two, who's going to hustle, right? Because my, my business is a very active business. I have things going on all the time, a lot of balls that I'm juggling. So it's very important to have a broker with a lot of energy, a lot of grit and gumption and commitment, who's gonna make sure that they're gonna you know, be all over the place, catching all those balls, making sure that you get that best offer. And then once you do get that best offer, you want someone who's gonna make your life as simple as possible, right? And limit your headaches and manage every aspect of the transaction so that you, the seller, or you, the buyer can sit back and relax and just sign on the dotted line and review documents and send things to your attorney while the broker makes sure that everything else is moving in a fluid fashion behind the scenes. So are a lot of your investors, I know you mentioned they're, you know, they're nationwide, are they struggling right now with a, a diminishing buying power due to interest rates? Are you seeing that a lot or is it still, um, or is deal flow still happening? So deal flow is happening. I mean, listen, I'm as busy as I was in 2022, 2021, 2020, and that's saying something, you know, I've got a full pipeline, a lot of deals, you know, that, that are, are moving through the process. So I'm in a great position, but the market in general has definitely slowed down. Transactional volume has definitely slowed down. I mean, the major big box, you know, CBREs, Marcus and Millichaps, JLL, they've all seen huge, huge, huge drops in revenue. And their revenue is fueled almost entirely by commission, which tells me that when the revenue goes down, clearly the, the deals have gone down. So, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why they're having more struggles. I mean, one is that there's a lot of dead weight in companies like that. A lot of people that are just kind of cruising along, not as professional brokers, but maybe more as an amateur or part-time broker. Um, but in terms of the other part of your question, yeah, listen, I mean, at the end of the day, when I look at, at, at a system, I look to understand it and define it in the simplest way possible. And if you look at net lease, really any type of commercial real estate, the, the driving factor in many cases behind the volume and the velocity of the market is going to be the spread between the rate at which you can borrow and the rate at which you get a return from your property, right? So if I have a six cap deal, right? Six cap deals were flying when interest rates were at 3%. Six cap deals are selling mostly to cash buyers now because rates are at close to 7%. So it's just simple math. It's that simple. Um, you know, we could talk for hours about what's going on with the Fed. We've got another decision tomorrow from, from Chairman Powell and, and the chair and the, uh, the, the you know board. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, I think that we're going to see tumultuous times uh, until interest rates stabilize for a sustained period of, let's say, 12 to, to sorry, uh, six to 12 months, which is not something that we've seen for the last, you know, nearly two years at this point. So this 
we're recording this on uh, September 19th. So for anybody who's watching and listening, um, obviously this is going to be a little bit in the past, but what do you think is going to happen tomorrow? Uh, I love predictions, right? Because if you're wrong, people yell at you. And if you're right, nobody remembers. But yeah, it's I, okay. I think that, you know, listen, I was looking for a pause at this meeting. I think that, you know, I follow those meetings very closely. Every single one of them, I'm tuned in. I got my shades down in my office. You know, it's just, it's blinders. Um, but it seemed like, you know, from what Chairman Powell, and I think, by the way, as a side note, you know, the decisions are very important. What, what the movement in in in, uh, in the federal fund rate is important. But I think equally as important is the commentary that Chairman Powell shares afterwards. So, I mean, what I've seen in the last several meetings is that there's indications that in 2023, there was going to be a pause at a certain point, right? A sustained pause. And, and I, I believe that there, there at this point, there will be one more rate hike. I'm going to go against the grain. A lot of people are calling for a pause tomorrow. I think there's going to be a 25 basis point increase only because the uh, CPI report came back and the CPI numbers were not exactly where we wanted them to be. It wasn't a huge gain, but it was a gain. It was going in the wrong direction. And I think that Chair Powell, if there's one thing that one message that he has hammered over and over at every single meeting for the last 18 or 24 months, it's that we are on a mission, you know, come hell or high water to return CPI to, uh, you know, a, a 2%, you know, level. Um, so I think we're headed for, you know, one more rate hike. I, I would have said that the rate hike would be later in the year, but I do think that it's going to be this, uh, this, you know, this upcoming meeting tomorrow. Yeah, I would agree. I think that there's going to be at some point, uh, the rate hikes are going to have to stop just simply because um, if they keep going up, I think it's going to be too detrimental to the economy. And and that's my yeah. personal opinion. I, I don't know. Obviously, anything could happen. Uh, we're not in charge. But um, have you noticed, and this is more just a generalized um, kind of idea that I've I've seen, it's that the, the value of the dollar just since because of inflation, it since it's gone down so much, the, the buying power of even if you have cash is is still so relatively low even with interest rates right now. So there, it's kind of finding that, um, and maybe you've seen this, but it's finding that middle ground of, yes, my you know cash offer is worth this much because interest rates are so high and someone can't outbid me. Yeah, I mean, I, the, so what the, I didn't quite follow exactly the last part sure, of what you said sure. in terms of somebody outbidding. So what I was saying is that it's really harder to find, you know, ca all cash deals for somebody right now, just because, um, even though they're going in all cash and maybe their buying power is a little bit less, you know, the value of their dollar isn't worth as much right now. Um, people are so used to, again, lower interest rates that even now at the higher interest rates, they're expecting such a higher all cash offer. It doesn't really matter that it's all cash, but they're really the only ones who can buy right now. Is that something you've seen where it's hard to find a deal that actually fits for your all cash buyers? I mean, so I did something interesting over the last year. Um, I pivoted a little bit more away from the vanilla, you know, five cap uh, deals into the deals that were trading at rates that were higher than debt, because I thought that that would be a good way to keep my volume up. And thank thankfully, it's been a great strategy. You know, like a lot of properties I'm selling right now are in the seven, seven and a half, eight, eight and a half, nine, even up to 10 cap range. Wow. So I've kind of changed a little bit uh, in terms of what I'm focusing on. Um, but in terms of your the first part of your question, Paul, yeah, inflation is a real thing. Um, I've seen it, uh, you know, all over the place. I, 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 I think that, you know, obviously in terms of the consumer goods and the things that we purchase on a day-to-day -day basis, they are definitely being affected. But what I think people aren't noticing is that inflation, well, obviously it's going to have an effect on real estate values, right? In, a, in, a, in an upward push. But in addition to that, something else that I'm seeing is, a, is an incredible inflation of rents, okay? So rents on properties are going up significantly. Why? Because the operator, hey, he's got a mortgage that, that he has a loan that he has to pay that now, you know, he's paying 7% instead of 3%. Or, you know, whoever the whoever's, you know, the one that's that's being hit, a business owner that's being hit, they're going to trickle that down. So the, the, the unfortunate thing is that at the end of the day, I say in a consumeristic society, the consumer always loses, right? So in the end of the day, interest rates go up, the, the operator that's operating the 
fast food restaurant raise, you know, they now uh, their rent goes up, right? Because the developer, the owner has to charge more money to have that tenant there because they have, it costs them more to build the property because the price of the sticks and bricks went up and the price of their capital went up because now they're borrowing at 7% instead of 3%. And now that the, 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 the uh, landlord is charging the tenant more rent, guess what the, the tenant is doing? They're raising the price of their coffee, right? And then at the end of the day, who's paying for all that? It's the consumer, right? So it's, it's very interesting to watch um, and I think that we're going to see a tremendous shift in real estate values uh, over the next five to 10 years because of what's going on right now. So do you think that real estate values are going to continue to go up uh, simply that the consumer is going to be paying for the the raise in um, real estate values? Or do you think there's going to come a, a stagnant point similar to um, with the rate hikes and then potentially, you know, maybe the bubble pops, right? Or and it goes down. What, what do you see happening? Yeah, so it's very, very fascinating. So, so I want to look at this from the residential and commercial perspective. Okay. So from residential perspective, typically a market cycle is about ten years. Okay. So, you know, if you if you really go back and look, uh, prices started leveling off and then going upwards at a slight trajectory, albeit in, around two thousand eight, two thousand nine. So a 10-year cycle would have put us at 2018, 2019, okay? So at, at, at a minimum, right, we're almost five years past that. This cycle has continued. And I, you know, I, I think that at the end of the day, the number one factor that's continuing to keep residential real estate values high is a lack of supply. We just simply have less homes being built than we have new homeowners entering into the market. So so long as your supply is constrained the way that it is, these interest rates really haven't affected the uh, price of homes. You know, what's incredible, actually, is, you know, I look at when I look at, re at, at residential real estate, I don't only look at the value. I don't only say this property costs six hundred twenty five thousand dollars. Your average homeowner is not paying cash for that property. Your average homeowner is getting a 30 year fixed mortgage for that property. So what's the real cost of that property? Well, thanks to, you know, Dodd Frank. Um, act inside of your closing package, it's mandated that you have a document that shows you exactly what it's going to cost to own that home over the lifetime of your mortgage. And it's not 525,000 or 625,000, whatever I just said, it's double, it's triple that. And right. now that rates are at 7% roughly, it's even, it's even greater. So what's incredible is like values have stayed the same in many cases, but the price to own the home has like doubled or tripled, which is absolutely incredible. But yet the market is still moving. And again, that's because you have constrained supply. So I don't see the residential mar market, um, you know, facing too much, uh, you know, like I would say friction, unless rates were to go up another, you know, 200 basis points, which they're not going to. In terms of commercial we have seen a repricing, okay? So as most people know, you know, like you just mentioned, Paul, we're prior to this meeting tomorrow. So we're, whatever happens this meeting tomorrow happens. But as of now, the federal funds rate has increased 525 to 550 basis points. That's five and a quarter to five and a half percent, right? Since March of 2022. So you're talking about 17 months, all right? That's an incredibly fast pace. So what's interesting is that across asset classes in the net lease space, if you look at dollar stores, those have been the large, the hot, the, probably the hardest hit. And that's because dollar stores used to trade at nine caps, eight caps, seven caps, six caps. When we got into the, the heat of this market, you know, a new 15 year dollar general in a good market was trading at like a five, one, five cap. Those same exact deals, 15 year, absolute triple net dollar general or whatever, type, whatever the, the structure of the expenses is, but 15 year deal in a decent market today, six, one, five, six and a quarter. So you're talking about 100, 110 basis points. That's the, the hardest hit. Fast food, your typical, let's say you had a Taco Bell, a 15 year Taco Bell in a good market. It was trading at a five and a quarter cap, you know, two years ago. Today it's a five and a half, maybe five, seven, five. So you're talking 25 basis points, 50 basis points of movement. But the federal funds rate has gone up 10 to 20 times more than that. It doesn't make sense. So I think the security and stability of net lease has made it so attractive that despite these rapid and massive in interest rate increases, the stability of pricing has maintained itself. I would agree. And I think that um, I actually saw something on LinkedIn just yesterday, and it was um, this is slightly back to the residential side of things, but there was a, um, a loan officer who just penciled out the math and it was uh, 
$80,000 salary. And they were putting, you know, three and a half percent down on a, a FHA loan and um, just a pretty standard for maybe a first time home buyer. And uh, they couldn't afford it. It was they needed an extra forty thousand dollars from a spouse. Uh, and that was with like eight hundred credit, a six and a half percent interest yeah. rate. I mean, they couldn't afford a five hundred thousand dollar home. And so eighty thousand dollars is what a lot of individuals who especially are starting to get their first home are usually making. Um, and it it just it kind of blew my mind because it was something that, um, you know, makes home ownership or the American dream a lot harder. And uh, it's it's sad to see almost. Yeah, I mean, no doubt cost of home ownership and renting is skyrocketed. And, and I mean, it's just what happens when when you pull that lever. Right. Do you think um, that this same effect is going to cause uh, more people to stop investing in commercial real estate. And I know that people will still invest in it, of course, but there will be maybe a mass exodus to work from home or things of similar nature. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I think at, when you mentioned work from home, I think you're alluding to to office. I right. mean, I think office is in for a rocky ride. I mean, I just this morning, I mean, I drove past many vacant you know, office buildings that were beautiful and wonderful in 1975 when they were built, right? Right. Um, so there's going to be a change there. I, I am not an office broker, nor do I want to be one. Um, <laughs> in terms of commercial real estate, I think that it's an excellent, excellent uh, investment vehicle. It's stable. It's secure. I mean, listen, I invested in, 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 I invest in stocks and I invested in Netflix and Amazon and Target, you know, during the pandemic. And I was so excited when I saw those values going through the roof. And then in a matter of weeks, those stocks lost 50% of their value, right? Find me a commercial building, right? That's going to lose 50% of its value overnight. It doesn't happen, barring something catastrophic, right? So commercial real estate will always be secure. It'll always be stable. There will always be tax advantages, right? That's huge. There will always, well, I hope there will always be tax advantages, but for right now, there's tax advantages. And so long as we have a friendly administration, a business-friendly administration, there will be. And, and I think that's, a permanent thing because there's too many politicians that own real estate. So listen, I mean, at the end of the day, there's vehicles like the 1031 exchange that allow you to buy a property at a million bucks, let it appreciate to 3 million, sell it, defer all of your gains, all your taxes on gains till the next time and keep going and keep going and keep going until you die, at which point it, it, the, the tax basis gets stepped up from the million bucks to the current value of what's called seven or 8 million. And now it's passed on to your heirs. No one's ever paying taxes on those gains. You can't do that with stocks. You can't do that with bonds. So I think that real estate will always be valuable. It will always be desired. And at the end of the day, we haven't seen much movement in value. So, you know, I, I think that the market is hungry. There's a lot of capital on the sidelines. Uh, when we see interest rates inevitably uh, lowered, I think the market is going to roar. I, I just, I do. I really do. Perfect. And I know you and I talked about this just before. Um, you're actually involved in a big net lease repurposing investment deal. Um, I don't know how much of it you can discuss or would like to discuss, but uh, can we dive into that? Yeah, so I, I'm really passionate about this. I mean, I think there's a lot of opportunity because, frankly, there's a lot of great real estate in the country. There's also a lot of businesses that have had a very difficult time. A lot of there's just been a lot of blows that have been dealt to businesses of all different sizes over the last few years, and many of those businesses have, uh, you know, uh, vacated their 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 locations or they've gone bankrupt. Um, and this presents a tremendous opportunity because the real estate itself is valuable. It's just that the operator who was there wasn't able to make it work, not because of the real estate, but because of their own issues internally. So what we're doing, myself and a partner, is we're taking uh, an, a vacant property and uh, retenanting it with a major national chain. Um, and it's going to be great. It's a win-win-win because you know everyone benefits, the, 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 the individuals in the transaction benefit, the, you know, neighborhood benefits, the city benefits. Um, and at the end of the day, we'll have a really nice product that's going to, you know, serve the, again, just like that property back in 2005 that, that I drove up to, it didn't suit its occupant, right? It needed to be repurposed. Same thing here. This property is going to be repurposed and we're doing the exact same thing. That's what I love. It's the same concept. You have something that has in inherent value, you make changes to it, and now it's got even more value. And do you ever, uh, going back to what you did at the very beginning when you started out, do you ever do that anymore where you go back and, and help uh, the disabled families to repurpose their homes? Or was that just kind of how you started? 
you know, my my best friend and his and his brother still run that company. They're doing amazing. They're they've been massively successful and they've been able to help a lot of people. Um, it's not something I'm currently in, or, or still involved in, but uh, definitely a great cause and you know a, a rewarding and noble thing for them to be doing. What are what are some of your passion projects? What are some of the things you like to do outside of uh, real estate? I, I think my number one probably is racing. I love racing. I actually just uh, was at Michigan International Speedway on Sunday. So just two days ago uh, in a Ferrari 488 GTV, which was absolutely incredible. Got her up to 136 miles an hour on the track. Uh, just totally exhilarating. I mean, I'm somebody that I've got a lot of passion, intensity and energy. And sometimes, you know, I get to, I get to use a lot of it up in my in my career, but sometimes I'm left with a surplus. So for me, being able to do something like go out on the track and burn it off is in, in a controlled, relatively safe environment is awesome. Uh, I play guitar. I've been playing guitar since I was nine years, uh, seven years old. Um, so that's a, a big passion of mine. Usually, I'm into I do a lot of yoga. Um, I've been slacking on that a little bit. Um, and then, you know, I'm passionate about my family, my wife, my kids. You know, just uh, I, I love especially my older kids. I have five kids and, you know, my older kids are at that age where they're asking, like, like the questions they're asking are like the questions that like, I want to know the answer to, or like something that makes my wheel spin. So I love being able to like sit down and explain something with them or to, to do projects together, or like just to watch them grow and develop. I mean, my oldest is, uh, is almost 15. Wow. And just to see, you know, see her and, and her siblings, grow into, you know, young adults is it's, it's incredible. That's awesome. I mean, I think you might've already answered it, but my next question and my last question was what's your, why, why do you do what you do? Yeah. You know, I honestly ask myself that on a regular basis, because I, I know what a lot of it is, but I also sometimes wonder what the rest is. I mean, definitely as I think you alluded to, like my family is my why my kids are my why, like I want to leave them with something that they can step into. And if they want, you know, take over. You know, my dad was a business owner and he sold his pharmacy, you know, when I was in high school, I never had that opportunity to, to work in a family business, but I would love for my kids to do that. Um, you know, I also, I think, so, so again, family and my children is definitely a big why I think freedom, like, you know, just being able to, to have that freedom. I have a lot of freedom now, but I hope in the next few years, I'll have more. Um, that's important to me. Um, and then, you know, I get a lot out of, out of training and, and mentoring people. Um, I just got off a call. It's the reason I was a minute or two late with somebody that uh, may come over as a junior broker. And uh, I'm excited because I can have the opportunity to help somebody, um, you know, be successful in an incredibly rewarding career. I mean, that's something not only can I help change his life, but what about his wife and his family and his kids and everything? I mean, that to me, I love teaching I love that kind of stuff. Education, um, it's I'm very passionate about. And you know, I want to I want to spread the knowledge and 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 grow uh, and grow together. Well, I love it. And I hope that uh, anybody listening right now, uh, if you guys feel the same way, if you like helping others, reach out to Dan. Let him know if you need any help in commercial real estate. Um, Dan, do you help at all, at all with uh, residential real estate? I mean, you know, I have a lot of experience in house flipping, so I can definitely advise in that. And I, I can be definitely be a resource, not to the same level uh, sure. and, and specificity as I can in commercial, but I definitely can be a resource. Perfect. Well, if you need a resource, anything real estate, give Dan a call. Dan, what's the best way for someone to reach out to you? Yeah, so you can find me on LinkedIn. My first name is Dan. Last name is Lukowitz, L-E-W-K-O-W-I-C-Z. Again, L-E-W-K-O-W-I-C-Z. Follow me there. Send me a DM. Uh, I'll also give out my cell phone. If you want to talk shop in real estate, if you've got a deal, you want a second set of eyes, if you're looking to sell your property, if you want to know what your property is worth, if you want to buy property, again, if you just want to chat about real estate, my number is 248 943 2838 again, 248 9432838. Perfect. Well, Dan, thank you so much for hopping on, sharing all this information with us. And uh, hopefully, we can maybe get back on here a few months, talk about this, uh, this rate hike that uh, will happen tomorrow. 